Now, the thing, the philosophy is, I mean, I, I fundamentally believe that if we get the patient journey right from start to finish, there will be improvements in quality and experience. The reason I say that, if you look at every single ward every day, look at the delays that are there in the patient sat in a bed, requiring an imaging procedure which is going to take two days to do, an endoscopy which is going to take another four or five days to do, patient is not well enough to go home in between. You know, it's not within the, the remit of man to change that. What's to stop us saying we will create daily capacity in an imaging department for those inpatients to make sure they get their investigations done in a timely fashion? How many times did the doctors and the nurses actually beat their chest up that this patient be sat on the bed for four days waiting for an x-ray which could be done in ten minutes? And the times you actually walk around the ward, you take four cars to the x-ray department and the investigations are done there and then because nobody's raised it. Endoscopy department, similarly, so what I'm saying is that if we start causing those delays, now, Stafford Hospital, quality indicator, our length of stay is one day higher than our norm. One day, with several thousand patients, is going to cost you a lot of money. And it's going to deteriorate in terms of patient care. How many of our patients are frail elderly patients suffering from dementia? Who come into a hospital who have become disorientated and nobody wants to own them? Have we got the right workforce to look after these patients? Because the skill sets that are required to look after these patients are totally different. You know, 20 odd years ago we thought a doctor is a doctor. We then realized that the pediatrician is different. He or she brings a different set of skills. A pediatric nurse is different from a general nurse because they have to have different skills. Equally, you've got to recognize we've got an aging population. The skill sets that are required are different. And I don't honestly believe that we got enough doctors to look after the frail and elderly patients. Secondly, is it the right place for them to be in the hospital setting? You know, we've given primary care assurance that they don't have to do out-of-hours work. So they end up in a hospital. Within a hospital setting, you've got more and more junior doctors with limited competence because their training programs are shorter and shorter, who are less and less risk averse. So what do they do? They admit this patient. Probably the last thing to do for some patients to be admitted into hospital when they could be cared in the community far better. So and we actually create problems for our own being. So therefore doing the right thing for the right people at the right time does make a difference. So these are examples of how we do things. Now, patient safety, you know, these are the three elements of quality. How do we keep our patients safe? And how do we actually, yes, we keep them, who keeps them safe? Everybody keeps them safe, from the porter to the cleaner to the nurse to the doctor to the chief exec, everybody keeps them safe. So it's not just one person's responsibility. The porter who says to me that whenever I take a patient to the ward, from a ward to an x-ray department, there is no drip set stand to take their transfusion or whatever is going through the bloodstream. So he puts it down on the bed. So what actually happens because of dependency, the blood flows the wrong direction. Is that safe or unsafe? You realize two hours later that something else has happened the wrong way around. So listening to that porter telling you there is a problem and all it takes is to buy a drip stand which costs next to nothing. And as soon as you know about it, you buy the drip stand that can be stuck on the bed. So simple, simple things make a big difference. Patient experience, you know, do we listen to all that in the letters? Do we actually take in the sort of themes that we bring up and do something about them? Now in our hospital, staff attitude was the number one complaint arena for the last three or four months. And we've actually addressed it by saying professional attitudes at work must prevail. And we will be intolerant of poor behaviours at work, irrespective of doctors or nurses. Yes, I have disciplined two doctors recently for exactly that, so it means that doctors aren't immune. As an exec director, I have a responsibility to every member of staff, irrespective of grade or specialty, because you've got to treat them the same. Now, improving outcomes means that you got to have the right staff. You know, if you look at outcomes, how do you provide specialist surgical services within a small hospital setting and have a safe on-call rotor? 
the days of general surgery are long gone. There is no such thing as general surgery because surgery now consists of breast, vascular, upper and lower GI surgery. So the surgeons that do those procedures must be appropriately trained. The new generation of surgeons can no longer cover for each other. So your surgeons that used to cover for urology, for head injuries, for children are no longer going to be available in the next generation. So how do we provide those specialist services? Reducing harm. You know, the, one of the big things is how do we make sure that we measure the harm that we do? Review the workforce. Have you got the right workforce to deliver what we need to deliver? You know, we talk about this wonderful mantra of consultant delivered service. Have you looked at the cost of it? If you have looked at the cost of it, have you gone on to implement it? Yes, I want, you know, a specialist to see every single patient, but I haven't got the infrastructure to do it. Now, we need to sort of focus on protocols and clinical protocols, guidelines to make sure that they are fit for purpose. Non-compliance with guidelines. The guidelines were non-existent in surgical departments when we started. They were four, five, six years old. Nobody actually looked at them to say they need updating. Until our NHSLA assessment came up and suddenly discovered that thousands of our guidelines are way out of line and they weren't even up to date. Leadership and clinical engagement. Leadership, you know, what is leadership? Everybody's a leader, everybody's a follower, depending on who you are, where you are, what you do. So there are going to be occasions as the ward sister, ward manager, whatever we call this week, yes, you are the leader, irrespective of the senior consultant coming, because you are the leader. If all four consultants want to do a ward run at the same time, you don't have the infrastructure to support ward runs. So you might say, why did you come in an hour's time? when I'll be free for you, because continuity of care is what's missing. We have fragmented healthcare beyond belief. We have junior doctors who now work 48 hours. We have numerous consultants who work different shift patterns. So who looks after the patients on a continuous fashion? The ward is the only place where there's continuity of care, and therefore if effective ward runs don't take place, it won't happen. Accountability, you know, Yes, you know, the accountability for me does rest with the clinician who warns the patient. You know, the, the consultant is responsible in terms of the regulator for his or her to ownership of that patient. Whoever they delegate that responsibility to has to be somebody trained to do the job they want to be doing. And if they're not trained, you are ultimately responsible. One in ten patients get harmed in the NHS. That is a huge number, and I think that is probably an underestimate. That means that somebody's urinary catheter will be left in for two days too long, therefore they give them a urinary tract infection. That means the venflon is left in for too long. That may mean that somebody's not had VTE thromboprophylaxis and ends up four days later, five days later, post-discharge on a medical ward where the connections are never made. So we have a fragmented health system that doesn't look at that. Now, reduction in harm will improve quality. So if that patient with VT prophylaxis had that, they would have been admitted with a DVT and a V pulmonary embolism the following week. Delayed diagnosis. Series of junior doctors can't make a decision. So they leave it. They fail to escalate the problem. So two days later, somebody sees and looks at it, it's barn door case X, Y, or Z, by which time, the patients had morbidity already for suck, suck in two days, they say, an acute abdomen. Delays in implementing care. How many times do we nursing staff tell you, I've been bleeping this doctor? And in one occasion, this nurse recorded in this sheet, she bleeped this doctor 21 times. And that was the sole action that was taken. And when challenged, you know, why didn't you ring somebody else up? Why didn't you pick the phone up to ring the consultants? Oh, we don't ring the consultant in this hospital. And I said, you do from now on. Because if the consultant doesn't respond, you've got every job to say, that is part of the culture chain that needs to happen. And I mentioned the nice guidance earlier on, you know, in terms of adherence to nice guidance. What is it that stops the clinician ignoring national best practice, which is based on evidence, 
you know, the latest is evidence on cesarean section. I care to debate later on with anybody who wants to, but that's a different issue for us. Now, failure to comply with the WHO safe surgery checklist. This checklist was devised on the back of several cases of wrong site surgery. Nationally, internationally acclaimed to be a fantastic model for patient safety. You go into the hospital, you get told by the governor's department, that's in place. And as Mike said, how do you know it's in place? So you, I turn up in theatre one day and noticed what actually happened in theatre. You have an autocratic surgeon and an autocratic anaesthetist who think it's a load of nonsense. And I saw one surgeon rip one of these sheets up because he thinks it's complete. It's a load of nonsense. And I said, it's not a load of nonsense. It re got re-implemented. And it finally got re-implemented six months ago, having been told it's implemented over two years ago. Fully implemented. Now it's properly implemented, it's audited. So what I mean is that you get told what's happening. So the board would have been assured two years ago that the WHO checklist in your hospital is working, and it wasn't. Now, workforce and skill bricks, yes, we need to get the right numbers. Where do you get the benchmarking for nursing? I think that's for Colin to answer, because obviously he's the expert. Where does the benchmark data based on? What's the acuity tool all about? And I think like Colin will, I'm sure, answer that. For the medical workforce, how many doctors do you need in the hospital to run the service will depend on how you want to run the service. In some areas, you might say, let's run it with consultants only. Invest in more consultants because they will do the thing that you want done early. They will see the patient early, treat the patient early, discharge the patient in a timely fashion. Training and supervision, and I mentioned earlier on that that's been a problem. Consultant job plans, consultant job plans, staff are seems to be a hospital which is run for the doctors and not for the patients. So some of the job plans need to recognize what the department needs, what the trust needs, and will need changing, and be in the current process of changing them. There's a lot of noise, and it will continue to be noisy, but it needs to be done because that's what the patients need to happen. So, for example, you want a physician to do a ward run every morning to make sure that patients are discharged in a timely fashion, so the a &E backlog doesn't happen. The a &E four-hour target is not an a and &E target, it's an organisational target. All it demonstrates is organisation inability to deal with the patients that are going through the system. So unless the consultants do a ward run, the timely discharges don't take place. So if a discharge happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody has sat in an a and &E department from whatever time they came in till 3 in the morning until they find a bed. That's inappropriate, isn't it? We won't want our loved ones to be on a trolley for four to eight hours. Now, in terms of separation of emergency and elective work, yes, in an ideal world, if you can do that, that's helpful, but most acute hospitals can't. What's the role of the acute physicians? In our hospital, the acute physicians are in hospital till 8.30 every night, having started in the morning. So every single medical referral gets a consultant opinion within three hours of admission. And I think that's a fantastic record. And I'm proud of the fact that they do a fantastic job. But I can't say the same with the surgeons. So it's not, it's not all win-win on, sadly. And early access to senior opinion means that you get the diagnosis early, you get the interventions early, it's much safer for patients. And our reduction in mortality, you know, Yes, 127 was the figure that we started off with, which precipitated the Healthcare Commission investigation. It currently sits at 86 and is sat below 100 for 18 months. And the biggest difference is the treatment of acute myocardial infarction, heart failure and pneumonia. Frail elderly people with pneumonia, unless you give them antibiotics in an early fashion, will suffer. That's a sad thing, that giving antibiotics in early fashion makes a difference. Treatment of heart failure, similarly. And our big improvement is in those areas. The other area of improvement is that we stopped doing stroke. Because we felt we didn't have a, a stroke unit able to cope with the stroke services. So sadly we lost that mortality, some of that is impacting on reductions. So all of it is doing the service reconfiguration plus clinical improvements in how we do things. And I mentioned the general surgical thing. Is it still valid to this day? You know, consultants, specialists, specialists, 
you've got to you actually concentrate on those precious areas. Now, so having, if you need a hospital such as ours with seven surgeons, how do you have seven in each specialty? We had three deaths from laparoscopic cholecystectomy, three lap serious bile duct injuries in a year. So we changed practice. So therefore, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a specialist procedure, it's done by specialist surgeons. And for the last 18 months, touch would no mishaps happen because it is done by trained specialists. So for patient harm, yes, we've done it. There's a lot of noise in the system because every surgeon believes it's their basic bread and butter procedure. I happen to disagree with that. Waste in theatres. Every theatre session, if you look at the amount of time a surgeon physically operates, in a four hour session you'd be lucky to get one hour 30, one hour 40 operated. Why is that? Because of the inefficient way we use our theatres. It's a very expensive resource, yet we don't use it properly. And on top of that, we cancel cases because we can't admit patients on time. So therefore what happens is we pay our surgeons waiting list initiative money, extra money, to do the work they should have done in proper time. And part of it is an organisational issue that we should clear the beds up for the surgeons to operate properly. But secondly, when they operate, they should work efficiently to make sure they use the resource properly. And I mentioned a and &E target. It's not an a and &E target. Delayed discharges. Every morning, you know, you get this list of delayed discharges. Now we have a bed meeting every morning where we actually ask questions, why is this still a discharge? Is it because the community won't take this patient? If so, what is the responsibility of the community in that? If it's delayed discharges because of war drones, we actually make sure they happen. Whole email trail, and even yesterday, that certain people weren't turning up for war drones. Yes, we keep on doing that. Part of culture change is that you may fix something for a short period of time, but to make it remain fixed, you've got to persistently revisit it and revisit it virtually every day and it becomes tiring but you still got to do it. Medical outliers on surgical wards, you know, we have the opposite. We have large, you know, we don't have many outliers actually. There were two the other week and yet we still have numerous breaches in ANA &E because of delayed discharges. And I mentioned, you know, waiting resource and cancel patients. We cancel patients because of all sorts of reasons and then double the cost by paying waiting this initiative money. New technologies, you know, laparoscopic surgery. Fantastic. You know, how do we go about introducing that? How do we make sure that vascular surgery and advanced recovery procedures are in there for patients to be dealt with in a, in a timely fashion? Now, what I'll do is I'll, what I'll, I'll finish off with a story about checking as to see what happened. We had two deaths, as I alluded to earlier on, from people who'd fallen off a trolley in an a and &E department head injuries, I mentioned the nice guidance about scanning. One of the actions was to buy a low profile bed. An action was, low profile bed was bought. At the board meeting, I got asked by the chief exec, is the low profile bed there? I had been to check it, it was there. But what I failed to check was that it wasn't working. It needed a tweak and a button. So when I went back to check it that afternoon, it still wasn't working. We got the engineer in. All he needed was to tweak a little button at the bottom of the bed. But without that checking, you would never have found out that the bed, if somebody had come in that night, that bed still wouldn't have worked. So this is where you need to go back and recheck to reassure yourself that not only is the bed there, but it's physically present and it works. So I think I'll stop there for a bit. Five more minutes, so give me five. Now, one of the things we did was looking at CD engagement to say, how do we get more clinicians on the top floor? We had three clinicians who represented all the clinical bodies. We had then went to eight clinical directorates. Sadly, we've gone back the other way again because the management structure has reversed itself. But having done that for two years, a lot more clinicians involved in management positions, either as clinical leads or as sort of service leads. So in a way, although we've gone down to more manageable divisions because of the size of the organization, but there are more clinicians involved. So clinicians turn up on management board. So therefore, any clinician, clinical decision that's taken is taken with clinical input. Now, 
Woolworth was a piece of work that was done. Professor Woolworth came from Cambridge to tell us what should a basic services be in a medium-sized district general hospital. A district general hospital cannot provide every single service. How does it provide services in partnership with bigger trusts? Look at vascular surgery, for example. National edict is to move vascular surgery to bigger centers. How do we do that in a safe, organized fashion? So the clinicians to lead the whole work, see how they want to make it work. And part of the big program is make sure that our leaders are appropriately trained to do the job we want them to do. A clinical director is appointed. What do we put into place for them to be trained, to be supported, to be mentored? And I'm sure we'll hear about that later on in terms of how we develop our leaders for Miriam, I'm sure. But the important thing here is to say, how do we develop them? And it's not a job, isn't it, the end of it, that they need continuous mentoring and support. So thank you, I'll stop that. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs>